Hello everyone, and welcome back to another R tutorial video. And in this video, we're going to continue our discussion on plotting in R. So what I want to do is pick up exactly where we left off before. So we have our R session here, and we're going to close our histogram because we're going to move on to box plots. So box plots are a little bit different. Um, they're a little more complicated than the histogram in the sense that the histogram only required one variable. The box plot, now we're moving into something that requires two. And so, as always, I want to begin with the base R implementation of box plots. And that is with a function called box plot. <laughs> Simple enough. So what box plot requires is it requires a formula. And the way that the formula is designated in a box plot is with a y variable, which is going to be the number, the numeric variable that you're interested in. So in this case, we're going to stick with sepal width. And then you use what's called the tilde, which is the shift backtick. So that's shift and then the, the number key directly above the, um, the tab key. So the formula equals sepal width tilde. And then we need the categorical variable that's going to split the box plot up. And that is going to be our species. Right, remember up here we have sepal length and species. And then it also requires the data. To which data set are you pulling from? And that is going to be, again, the iris data set. So if we run this code, you'll see here that we have a box plot. Now what I'm going to do is this may seem kind of strange, is I'm actually going to rerun the code down here in the console. Because now, because we're comparing things, I want to make use of this plots tab over here so that we can quickly change back and forth and compare things. So this is the default R implementation of box plot. The formula, which is the numeric variable, which would be the Y, tilde, and then the X variable, which in this case is the species. And this is categorical. And then data to tell you which data set you're pulling from. So this is, again, this is the base R. And we can do the same thing in GG. Two. So I'm going to assume here that we've already installed and used library to pull in ggplot. I'm not going to go back through that. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to make the box plot in ggplot. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time going into a little more detail the different parts that we have, the data and the mapping and the aesthetics. And I want to show you three different ways that we can arrive at the same plot. And I want to explain the sort of nuances as to why you would do one construction over the other. So let's just do the, the one that we're most familiar with. So we're going to call it ggplot, right? We're going to create that default ggplot object. And if you remember from our previous discussion on histograms, you have two things that you have to pass in data, saying which data set are we looking at. And this is going to be the iris data set again. And then we have that mapping. G. Mapping equals, and then we call this AES, or aesthetic function. And just to recap here, what this is doing is this is saying, telling ggplot what components of the data set are we going to use to generate the plot? What are we going to use for x? What are we going to use for y? And we'll talk in, in some later videos about things like color, shape, and size. But for now, we're going to keep it simple. We're going to just need an x variable and a y variable. So in this case, we can use our original box plot here as an example to keep things straight. The y-axis here is our numeric variable. So we would call this sepal dot width. And our x-axis here is going to be the categorical variable, which is species. So if I were to run this right now, just to sort of recap what we've done before, 
you will see that we get an empty plot. We have the x and y axis set up, but we don't have any actual plotted information. And that's because if you remember from our histogram, we have to add the geometry on top of a geometry layer on top of this to specify what do we actually want to put in our ggplot. And that is again done with the plus sign. And then the geome construction with an underscore. And then we're going to pick the one we want. And in this case, we want the box plot. So we want the geome box plot. And if we run this, and then we will execute it again here. So the reason that I want to do this is I want to have access to this plot function here. So I want to just quickly run the implementation of box plot again. So this is the box plot from base R, and this is the box plot from ggplot. And you can see that although they look somewhat different, the information is all the same. And again, we're going to talk about customizing plots in later videos. But what I want to do now is I want to talk about the, some different ways that we could actually construct this ggplot. So we have this first construction here where we put everything inside of ggplot. We have another way that we could construct this, and this is where we leave the ggplot empty. And then when we add the geome underscore box plot. If I were to run this right now, you would get nothing. Well, I should run it right now. All right, if we run this code, you'll see that we still have the gray box. And that's because in this particular ggplot, we have no idea what the data is, and we have no idea what the mapping is. So even though we're saying make a box plot, it doesn't know anything. So in this one, we passed in all of the information into the ggplot call. We could also get the same result if we pass in everything into the box plot call and not the ggplot call. So if we run this, and then we run this again, you'll see that we get the exact same thing that we got before, but instead of passing the information into ggplot, we passed it into geome box plot. Now you may be asking yourself, well, why does this why does this differentiation matter? And it matters for one very important reason. When we start to build more complicated figures with ggplot, being able to customize each individual layer in terms of the data and the aesthetics becomes important. The way that ggplot2 works is when you call a geometry, so for example, a geome box plot or geome histogram, it is going to look in ggplot first to figure out the data and the mappings. So if you put your data and your mappings into ggplot, into this first call, it will use that by default. Let me show you what I mean. So let's say that we did this, right? We put the ggplot data and iris here, but we wanted to actually make the box plot instead of with sepal width, we wanted to make it with petal width, right? So we'll pass in this aesthetics, fix our issue with our um, thing there. So instead of sepal width, we do petal width. So if we run this, it's not going to crash, but if we make the plot of it, you will see that we still have sepal width, right? Even though in the geom box plot, we specified we wanted petal width, it went into ggplot and took the ggplot information first. So hopefully, I know this may not be, let me, um, let me undo that so that way we don't get confused here. So just to recap here, if you put the data and mappings into the ggplot call, everything that comes after it, 
will default to what is in the ggplot call. So you have no ability to differentiate your geomes. If you leave the ggplot blank and you call everything in the geomes, then each geome can call its own set of information and you get more flexibility. So again, two different ways to construct the same ggplot, but these constructions are different in that the first one, this geome box plot, pulls everything from ggplot. In the second one, the geome box plot is free to do its own thing. And when we start to add additional layers, this construction um, may, be, may be more important. So I just want to show you one alternative, one more way that we could make things more complicated. And that is what we can do, is we can actually break this up. We can do data equals iris in the ggplot call. And then we can do geome underscore box plot. I'm just going to copy and paste here to save a little bit of time here. We can do the mapping in the geome call. So if we run that, and then we do that, you'll see that we again end up in the same place. So this is probably, in my opinion, the best alternative. You set your data sets in the, the plot call, in the ggplot call, but then you specify your mappings to the individual um, geome calls. So I know this was a little bit longer video. I know it was a little bit confusing because we looked at three different constructions for the same plot. Hopefully it made sense. If anything seemed confusing, I encourage you to pause the video, go back, rewatch the parts you're confused about, and as always, please reach out. Thank you.